Welcome everybody today to the uh, next uh, DeFord lecture series. We're very happy today to have uh, Ryan Smith joining us and uh, Dr. Chen will tell us a little bit about Ryan and his research in just a minute. Uh, as most of you know, the DeFord lecture series is named after Ronald uh, Kennison DeFord, who was a faculty member and graduate advisor here in the Department of Geological Sciences for many years, going back uh, to uh, starting in 1948. Uh, and he was a longtime uh, organizer of what was then called uh, Technical Sessions, our Departmental Speakers Program. And so the Speakers Program is named in his honor. It's been a longstanding tradition to bring uh, cutting edge research, uh, spanning the broad breadth of, of geological sciences to the department. And um, in continuing in that tradition, we have Ryan Smith. So to tell us a little bit more about Ryan, I will hand over to Dr. Chen. Uh, thank you, John. And so Ryan Smith uh, got his bachelor degree in geology from Brigham Young University in 2014. And he got his uh, PhD in geophysics uh, from Stanford University uh, in 2018. While he was at Stanford, he was uh, an NSF a graduate research fellow. And in 2018, uh, he has been an assistant professor in the Department of Geosciences and Geological and Petroleum Engineering uh, at Missouri University of Science and Technology. And in the fall, he's, uh, he and his, his family gonna move to Colorado State University and uh, start his uh, new adventure there. So uh, why, uh, last year in two, uh, 2021, Ryan won the AGU Early Career Award uh, for the near surface geophysics section. And Ryan's, uh, Ryan's research interest is to study groundwater resources using satellite, airborne and a ground-based geophysical data set, primarily interferometric synthetic aperture radar or INSAR and electromagnetic EM data, uh, as well as some data. And uh, uh, he is also has a lot of, uh, uh, he has an expertise in hydrological modeling as well. So now we will uh, leave the rest of the seminar to Ryan to talk uh, about uh, his recent work. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Anne, um, and, and thanks for everyone who's, who's organized this and given me this opportunity. It's great to, to be with you virtually, um, and uh, it, it sounds like a great seminar series. So as you can see, I'm going to be talking to you about groundwater today and, and how we can improve our understanding of groundwater using various remote sensing and, and geophysical data sets. <clears throat> so I like to start by motivating this a little bit. Now, I'm sure many of you already are totally on board, maybe all of you are on board that the groundwater is really an important resource, um, probably so, but, but I still like to motivate it a little bit. Um, so groundwater is our largest store of liquid fresh water by, by a lot. Um, surface water is, is a lot more accessible than groundwater is, and so people will often turn to that first for their, their water needs. However, as climate change continues, surface water supplies become less and less reliable, and, and on top of that, we also have land use change and population growth that are all driving an increase in water demand, both for drinking water supplies as well as for agricultural supplies. And so as a result of that, a lot of our aquifers are being depleted quite rapidly. Um, so this is a nice global study done by Gleason et al. that I'm showing you on the right here, uh, showing some of the world's major aquifers. And you can see some of the most prolific aquifers are being very rapidly depleted. So the, the plot or, or the, the map here is essentially showing that anything um, with a number over one means that there's, there are more withdrawals occurring than recharge into the aquifer. So the, the aquifer is, is uh, losing water or being depleted. And, and the aquifers that are highlighted in red are being depleted very rapidly. So you can see in the Western and Southwestern US, as well as, as Middle East and, and Asia, there's a number of, of major aquifers that are being depleted quite rapidly. So we know that, that groundwater is a critical resource and, and that we have a lot of it, but then in some areas we're starting to deplete it um, at, at a very unsustainable rate. So what does that mean? Um, what can we do with that information? So, so that has motivated a lot of the research that I do and, and has given rise to a few kind of overarching questions. So I'll, I'll give you a few of these questions. So, so first, what are the key drivers of groundwater flux or, or groundwater demand? And, and how do these drivers interact with each other at different scales, both the local and, and the continental? 
Um, so as we are using a lot of groundwater, uh, we're, we're then potentially altering the, the aquifer properties and, and uh, the properties of these groundwater systems. And so how are we doing that and, and how can we control that? And then finally, as we, as we do uh, deplete these systems, what are the downstream impacts on food security, on groundwater quality, and on health? So these are all questions that, that I'm really interested in answering. Um, the part of what motivates my work is, is also the fact that we have a massive amount of satellite and airborne and ground-based geophysical data, um, petabytes of data that can be related to groundwater system to help answer some of these really challenging questions. So this is not a comprehensive list of, of all of the different systems that, that are out there, but, but it's some of the more commonly used ones. And I'm, I'm just gonna briefly go over a few of them. So um, we have electromagnetics, both airborne and ground-based and, and uh, having airborne electromagnetics or, or towed systems as well has enabled a very rapid um, ability to, to acquire large amounts of electromagnetic data. This data can image the subsurface to, of, to depths of, of up to several hundred meters and give us an idea of the thickness of our aquifer systems, of the, the type of sediments or, or, uh, or rock that, that are making up these aquifers, potential flow barriers, and, and so on and so on. We also have um, satellite data sets. So interferometric synthetic aperture radar or INSAR um, can, and I'm, hopefully you've, you've learned all about that from Anne. Uh, but, but from that, we can, we can estimate changes in land surface elevation over time and relate that to groundwater systems. We also have estimates of evapotranspiration, which gives us an idea of crop water demand from various thermal and optical imagery. Um, and then finally, there's uh, uh, gravity data sets from the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment that can help us map out how the mass of the Earth is changing over time and relate that to, to water storage and groundwater storage changes. So like I say, we have a massive amount of data from all of these various data sets. And, and in my experience, I, I feel that we are collecting data at a much more rapid pace than we are actually able to use that data. Um, and one of the big problems there is that we, we don't have good models in place in, in many cases. Um, this isn't always the rule, but in many cases, we don't have good models in place to link these observations with, with either process-based or, or statistical models of, of groundwater. <clears throat> so that leads me to kind of the vision that we have in our, in our research lab. Uh, so first is, is to integrate these different data sets, these different geophysical data sets uh, to develop more holistic groundwater models um, and, and uh, develop modeling capabilities that are able to, to use these various data sets. And from that, we can then hopefully be able to improve our, our predictive capabilities and, and, uh, and enable model calibration in data sparse regions. And the next point is, is uh, how can we use these models then to improve our understanding uh, of how groundwater depletion is affecting broader societal issues. So water quality, human health, and food supply. So I don't have time to talk about everything today. So I'm, I'm going to focus on this first point today. Um, and I'll give you a few examples of some things that we're doing in our group. To, to work on that. Before I go any farther, I want to give a shout out to the research group. So some of these students have graduated already and, and some are still, are still with the group. Some are, some are just starting, um, but you're gonna see a number of, you know, a bunch of data sets and results and algorithms. And, and much of that was produced by the students that, that you see here. And I will, I will call them out by name as I, as I go through the talk. Okay, so, so here's the talk outline. I'm gonna start off by talking about um, how we can improve estimates of groundwater withdrawals at, at high resolution by integrating various remote sensing data sets. And there's a few projects that, that I'm kind of combining here and, and the two student authors that are, that are leading this are Sayantan Majumdar on the left and Fahim Hassan on the right. And then I also like to talk a little bit about stakeholders. So in, in groundwater, uh, we're looking at, at answering some, some critical science questions, but it's also, these are very real world problems. So uh, people are really interested in, in the, the results so they can understand what they can do to better manage their groundwater resources. And, um, 
So the stakeholders for, for this project are the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality, uh, the USGS, and the Arizona Department of Water Resources, and the Kansas Geological Survey. And then this is funded, again, this is a few different projects that I'm going to show you here, but this is funded by the USGS, uh, NASA, and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Okay, so we're seeing across the Western United States and in, in many other uh, watersheds across the U.S. that um, more and more of them are being more heavily managed as, as groundwater scarcity increases. So I'm showing you a sample here of, of a few different states. We've got Arizona, Utah, uh, Colorado, and California. So all of these states, and there's, and there's many others, it's just a, a sample here. But many of these states are, are implementing groundwater sustainability mandates um, that essentially mandate certain basins or, or in some cases the entire state to, to reduce their, their use of groundwater so that the groundwater system is no longer being depleted. Now, there's, there's a lot of debate and as there should be on, on what actually results in a sustainable groundwater system. We, you could be pumping a lot of groundwater and, and not having any change in groundwater storage, but you're still affecting the ecosystem um, by pumping that groundwater as downstream users can no longer use it. Um, however, the, in most cases, the goal here is, is to essentially reach a state where the groundwater, the aquifer is, is no longer being depleted. Um, and, and in some cases, the mandate is, is current. There needs to be no depletion as of right now. And in, in many cases, they're saying, we're going to give you 20 to 30 years from, from now. And, and as if you look at many of these plans, they, they have until uh, 2030, 2040, 2050 to implement some sort of sustainable groundwater plan. And if they don't do that, then their water rights will then be curtailed. So this, this has a very real effect on, on farmers and, and what their uh, livelihood will look like down the road. <clears throat> so one of the big problems here is if we want to understand what we need to do uh, to, to reduce groundwater depletion, it, it really comes down to pumping and, and how much pumping we need to reduce. The challenge is, as you can see from the slide, is, is that in most cases, we don't really know how much pumping is happening. So there's a few exceptions. In Kansas, every major use well is, is being metered. So, so the amount of withdrawals across that state are really well known. Colorado is pretty good as well. But if you look at most of the states here, um, we're at around 10 or maybe 20% of, of wells are being metered. And so we don't have a great understanding of how much groundwater is actually being pumped. And, and so that makes it really challenging to know how much we have to reduce pumping. And it, it makes it challenging for a lot of different groundwater uh, management scenarios because the, the modeling is also challenging when there's a high uncertainty in, the, in one of the biggest components of the water budget. <clears throat> so this isn't just a problem that's limited to the United States. It's, if you look at, at the world, um, it, it's a problem really, really across the world. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons why it was highlighted as, as one of the key needs, data needs in a recent workshop at the National Academy of Sciences. Okay, so, so I've, as I've mentioned, I do a lot of work with remote sensing. And, and so the angle I like to take is to see if we can use different remote sensing data sets to improve our understanding of groundwater use. And one of the data sets that I work with the most is, is INSAR or Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. And just as I'm giving this talk, so I, I always use this, this figure here to show what INSAR is. And, and I'm just realizing that, that it's from our own Jingyi Jing Chen at, at UT Austin. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the main idea of INSAR is it's a microwave radar method. You have a satellite that is orbiting the Earth. As it's orbiting, it's emitting radar pulses that travel to the Earth's surface and are reflected and come back to the satellite. Now, when they come back to the satellite, the satellite's able to measure the phase or the position along the wave. The wavelength of these systems is on the order of 10 centimeters. So some are around five centimeters, some are up to 20, 25 centimeters. Um, when the satellite makes a repeat pass over the same area, it will measure the phase again. So we get the position along the, along the wave again. By measuring the change in phase between passes, if the ground sinks a little or rises a little, then the wave will travel a little bit farther or a little bit shorter distance. And as we measure the position along the wave, that will change over time. So that change in phase allows us to resolve sub-wavelength changes in ground surface elevation. So we can get centimeter scale and sometimes even millimeter scale 
and could probably get you millimeter scale accuracy in, in these estimates of, of ground surface deformation. Um, so how does that relate to groundwater? Well, as we pump groundwater, uh, the subsurface will compact. And if it's a really hard consolidated rock, then it will compact a very small amount and it's not really detectable. If you have soft compressible sediments, um, such as clays, those will compact a lot more readily. And so you can detect that at the surface. Um, so I've already told you one kind of confounding factor. So we can, we can get estimates of, of groundwater properties and groundwater storage change with, with INSAR, but we really need to have compressible sediments in order to really see this happening. The other thing that we often need is a large change in, in groundwater level in the subsurface. And so you typically need a very pressurized system and, and confined aquifer systems tend to be much more pressurized and, and that results in much larger drops in groundwater levels. And that gives us a much bigger signal that's absorbable. So most of the time with INSAR, not all the time, but most of the time we're observing uh, deformation as a result of, of groundwater withdrawals in confined aquifer systems that have a lot of clay. <clears throat> okay, so, so as I mentioned, there, there's some limitations to INSAR and, and there's, there's certainly cases where, where maybe you could detect uh, groundwater storage changes in regions that have less clay or they're less confined, um, but I'm just giving you kind of some of the general limitations. One of the big advantages to INSAR is the resolution is, is pretty good. So it's a, a roughly a 50 meter resolution. There's a lot of other data sets that can be re related to, to uh, groundwater demand. Um, and I already mentioned GRACE, this gravity data set. Um, so with that, we can get the change in mass uh, globally and with about a month latent latency. Um, the big challenge there is it needs to be a huge signal. So the change in mass uh, needs to be very large to be detectable uh, by, by GRACE. So you end up with a pixel size that is 400 kilometers by 400 kilometers. So very, very large pixel size. And the challenge there is that um, it's, a, it's a really useful data set, but a lot of times to implement sustainable solutions, it needs to be at the local scale. Um, and it's challenging to utilize GRACE at the local scale. Um, there's a number of other data sets. I'm not going to go through these exhaustively, but, but there's evapotranspiration, um, precipitation, soil moisture, land use, and surface water extent. So all of those are related in some way to groundwater demand. Okay, so if we look at this as a water budget, we're trying to estimate groundwater withdrawals here. So we look at it as a water budget. If we could somehow estimate the change in storage with satellite data sets and the inflows into the groundwater system, then we could maybe estimate the outflows from that, right? We could solve some simple water budget. Um, the challenge here, as, as any hydrologist will know, is that uh, we don't really know any one of these components of the water balance very well. They all have a lot of uncertainty. So the goal then here is to say, well, maybe we don't know any of those that well, but, but we do have some reasonable proxies for each of these with different satellite data sets. And you can make the case that, that some of these are proxies for multiple, um, you know, maybe change of storage and inflow or, or inflow and outflow. So precipitation uh, can result in more recharge, but it also results in, in less groundwater withdrawals. At any rate, th th they all can be uh, proxies for at least one of these components of the water budget. So our goal then is to integrate those and see if we can somehow estimate groundwater withdrawals. The challenge is that none give a complete representation of a single water balance component. Um, and as I also mentioned, they're, they're also available at different spatial and temporal resolutions. Um, so one of the things that we hypothesized is that uh, groundwater use is, is driven by a number of factors. There's, so there's temporal trends that are, that are related to climate and, and have a fairly large spatial footprint. And so maybe these coarse resolution data sets are okay for estimating those temporal trends, um, droughts that, that, that occur, for example. And then you also have uh, a lot of water uses driven by very local scale land use, um, variability in land use. And so by integrating those two, we should be able to get a, a pretty reasonable estimate of, of groundwater withdrawals. <clears throat> um, so we use machine learning to, to integrate these data sets. And it, it's a way of essentially testing a hypothesis that I showed you. And the reason that we went with machine learning is that there really isn't a, a good, there are models out there, um, but, but there are a lot of limitations in, in the existing models on, on how they're able to handle these various satellite data sets. Um, and these satellite data sets uh, have a number of nonlinear relationships to each other and to the, 
to what we're trying to predict groundwater withdrawals. Um, so, so we decided to use machine learning uh, to, to estimate the, those relationships. A lot of people think of machine learning as a black box, but there are a number of machine learning methods that actually allow you to, to look at some of these relationships between different variables that we're, that we're using and what we're trying to predict. So we could look under the hood a little bit as well and, and uh, get at some of the processes. Um, so the study areas that we're looking at here are in Kansas, Arizona, and the Mississippi alluvial plain. And I'll show you some of the results from Kansas first. So like I mentioned earlier, Kansas is a great place to study this because they are tracking their groundwater withdrawals across the entire state. So we can test this method really well. Um, we've actually predicted withdrawals from 2002 to 2019, but I'm, I'm just showing you a sampling of the data here. So the actual withdrawals are on the left column here and here, and then the predicted withdrawals are on the right. Um, and then the year is, is so they're broken out by, by rows. So you can see that we're capturing the spatial trends in groundwater withdrawals pretty well. And, and we're also capturing the temporal trends. So there's some years where there's more pumping than other years, and, and we're capturing that in our, in our predictions as well. And we, we held out, we tried holding out some of the spatial data from our model and then testing it against that. And we also tried holding out some of the temporal data. So holding out several years at a time and seeing if we capture those temporal trends. And, and both of those were, were pretty effective. Um, so now if we can look under the hood a little bit and see what some of the main drivers are. Um, this is a, what we call a partial dependence plot. And it's, it's plotting the groundwater withdrawals on the y-axis against various predictors that we use. So agri, that's just the, the density of agricultural land. And you can see that is a really important driver. So as, as agricultural density increases, so does water use. Um, but we also had significant impact from more climate related variables, such as evapotranspiration and precipitation. So one of the things that, that was useful from this that we were able to then do was to break this out by groundwater management district. And, and so we did that and, and compared our predictions at the groundwater management district scale. Um, and, and we were also able to make forecasts so that the groundwater withdrawal data are not collected um, until typically it's, it's a year out until you collect all the data and, and QC it and everything. But we were able to make faster forecasts with, with our data sets. Um, and, and we could also predict groundwater withdrawals going into the future using different climate scenarios. Um, okay, so I don't have time to show you all of the results here, but, but I'm going to show you just kind of a, a high level view of, of what we're doing. So, so these are our predictions over Kansas. We've, we've also done something similar over Arizona. And one of the interesting things that, that we found between Kansas and Arizona, because Kansas is largely, it's the High Plains Aquifer, which is, which is largely unconfined, there's not significant subsidence that's occurring out there. Um, but in Arizona, that's not the case. So there's a number of basins that are confined and are subsiding pretty rapidly. And we were able to map out the relationship between withdrawals and subsidence in Arizona. Um, and again, I don't have time to talk about that in a lot of detail, but if there's questions about that, I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards. And then we're also working in the Mississippi alluvial plain um, where we actually do not have very good sampling. There's at best about 10% of, of wells are, are being metered for water use. And so that, that presents some unique challenges. Uh, we've been developing some methods to try to, to deal with that data scarcity. <clears throat> okay, um, so then we also are working on a similar project at the global scale. And this project is, is um, like I said, it's similar, but there are some key differences. So, uh, here we're trying to estimate land subsidence at the global scale using, using machine learning and, and some of these hydrologic predictor variables. And the motivation here is that land subsidence has, has a lot of risks associated with it. There's, you have a loss of groundwater storage, um, but there's also risks to infrastructure. And if you have a coastal city that's experiencing land subsidence or a coastal region, then that's increasing relative sea level rise and, and the likelihood of flooding and, and saltwater intrusion. And so there's a lot of concerns that go along with, with land subsidence. Um, land subsidence, as I mentioned, can be mapped using INSAR data, but the challenge there is it, it's not really feasible currently to do that at the global scale. There's a number of noise sources uh, that you have to deal with when you process INSAR data. 
and it's quite computationally expensive to process the data, even over a fairly localized region. And so here we, we took a number of existing subsidence studies and we processed some of our own subsidence data to train a model that predicts subsidence at the global scale. Okay, um, so kind of wrapping up this section of the talk, um, I hope I've shown you that, that uh, groundwater extraction can be related to various hydrologic fluxes with the appropriate spatial and temporal resolutions. Um, we found that land use was the most important driver in groundwater extraction, um, but, but climatic variables have to be accounted for as well, and, and those really help with the temporal characterization of, of water use. And then finally, we, we found that um, in terms of risk for subsidence, that highly stressed, unconsolidated aqu aquifer systems have the strongest potential for land subsidence and associated water storage loss. Okay, so I've spent the first part of the talk really diving into some machine learning based approaches to, to estimate groundwater use um, as well as land subsidence. And I think there's a place for that in the hydrologic community. I think there's a lot of times when, when that is the appropriate approach. Um, however, I, I also think there's a, a place for process based modeling, um, particularly when we, when we have the data sets that we need and we have the model that we need to, to produce the results. Um, so in, and as I mentioned, there's, there's many cases where we don't have really good models to relate these various remote sensing data sets to, to uh, process-based models. Um, but that's one thing that, that I've been working on here in this second project. So the main student author for this is Jawe. And then our stakeholders are the Utah Geological Survey, as well as the Enterprise and Iron Conservation Districts. So what's, what's motivated us here is, is um, this, this question, can we accurately predict future groundwater availability? And there's been a number of studies that have looked at the accuracy of groundwater models. And for those of you that have developed groundwater models, you know that there's, there's a number of sources of, of uncertainty, a number of assumptions that need to be made. Um, there's, there have been studies that have looked at post audits of groundwater models to see how they, how they did at predicting future groundwater availability. And, and they, they don't often do as well as, as we would hope that they would do. Um, there's also a number of studies kind of looking at the main sources of uncertainty in groundwater models. And, and what's been found is that, that one of the largest sources of uncertainty is conceptual model uncertainty. So what are the conceptual assumptions that we make going into our groundwater model? Um, and, and that ends up being very often the, the largest source of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So, one of my goals then is to see if we can integrate various satellite and ground-based geophysical data um, into our groundwater models so we can improve that conceptual model development and, and conceptual model uncertainty. And this is just kind of a visualization of, of some of the things we can do with, with geophysics. So this is a map over the Central Valley in California showing land subsidence mapped by INSAR uh, at the surface. And then on the subsurface, it's showing the resistivity um, which is related to, to geologic content. So lower resistivity um, is going to have more, more clays or higher resistivity will, will be coarser grain materials such as sands and gravels. And, and you can see some of the main clay layers that are being mapped out here and some of the main aquifers, uh, both above and below. This is the Corcoran clay right here. And you have the upper aquifer above it and the, the lower aquifer below it. <clears throat> so, you can see the wealth of information that is provided by these geophysical data sets. Um, and, and again, the goal here is to see if we can improve our, our conceptual understanding of, of groundwater models by, by using these geophysical data sets. So an example that I'm gonna talk about is estimating the change in aquifer system storage and where that storage is coming from. Um, and and uh, so kind of the, the classical way that we've looked at, at aquifers is as a sandy material that's bounded um, above and below or, or sometimes just below by a impermeable clay layer. And we kind of model most of the action is happening in that sandy aquifer. And a lot of our models are kind of set up that way to, to model like that. Um, so with this understanding, we have kind of a traditional approach for estimating change in, in aquifer system storage as the storativity S times the change in head delta H times the area. One of the challenges with, with this approach is that there's high uncertainty in the storativity, um, particularly over broad regions and in confined aquifers. 
Um, so the storativity in confined aquifers is a function of aquifer thickness, which can vary substantially and, and is can be challenging to map, as well as intrin intrinsic storage properties. Those can also vary by, by uh, usually a factor of, of two to three, the, the storativity, or the, sorry, the, the specific storage. So there's a new in-situ approach that was developed by Butler et al. Um, and that was out in GRL in 2016, out in Kansas. And in Kansas, as I mentioned, they have, they have great estimates of water use. So what they did is they took at the, at the water management district scale, they took the total groundwater use and plotted that on one axis against the average annual water level change on the Y axis. So you can see there's a really nice linear correlation here. Um, a, a bit of noise, but it's, it's really a quite nice linear correlation between water use and water level change. So by looking at, you can, you can look at the slope of this line to estimate your, the storativity of your aquifer system. You can also look at the point at which the water level change is zero. And at that point, you can assume that there is no change in storage in your aquifer system. And at that point, you can look at what the total water use is. So we were, what, 0.6 times 10 to the ninth uh, cubic meters. And, and you can estimate that as your net inflow. So that's what that's how much water is coming into your aquifer system. And if you pump less than that, then you'll have a net gain in, in aquifer storage. If you pump more than that, you'll have a net loss in aquifer storage. So this has been a really powerful approach um, in areas where we have good groundwater withdrawal estimates to, to estimate our change in, in aquifer system storage. Um, I say traditional here, it's really, it's quite new, but, it, but it's been around for maybe 10 years or so now, um, is this satellite-based approach using, using gravity uh, with GRACE or the GRACE follow-on satellite data sets to estimate changes in groundwater storage. And so with, with gravity, we're able to get the total change in water storage, and that's what's happening in soil moisture, snow and ice, surface water, as well as groundwater. And so if we have reasonable confidence in those other three components, um, we can estimate, we can subtract those out and estimate the change in groundwater storage. <clears throat> so this has been really effectively used and compared quite a bit with, with in-situ data sets. Um, a, a developing satellite approach is using deformation from INSAR data to estimate changes in groundwater storage. So I've already told you uh, what INSAR is. Um, I, I wanna talk just a little bit more about the, the processes that drive land subsidence. So you have pore pressure in the subsurface that's, that's supporting these sedimentary grains. Um, and when we pump water out of the aquifer system, that pore pressure drops and that causes an increase in effective stress, which is the total stress, the, the weight of the overburden subtracted by the pore pressure. So that effective stress is increasing as we're pulling water out of the aquifer system. And, and that results in a loss of, of porosity. And in confined aquifers, that loss of porosity is, is particularly in unconsolidated confined aquifers, it's, it's the main mechanism for storage loss. And so, so again, if we're looking at confined aquifers, INSAR is a pretty good method for estimating the, the total change in groundwater storage. So the study area that we chose to look at this is the Perwin Valley in Utah. We chose this area for a number of reasons. Um, it's a, a fairly well monitored basin. So groundwater withdrawals are, are monitored pretty well in this area. Um, it's, it's pretty enclosed. So, so there's not a lot of flow coming into the watershed and there's not really much going out either. It's a closed basin here. So this is the Little Salt Lake and, and no surface water leaves the basin. And there's, there's some good groundwater flow divides as well. And so there's, there's likely very little groundwater that's leaving the basin. Um, it's a primarily confined basin. Um, and, and there's also, because of the high groundwater use, there's been significant historical and current subsidence. So uh, this is a, a well pad out there. And we were just out there in the field um, a few months ago and, and the, the farmers didn't even believe us that this was land subsidence. They thought maybe there was some other cause for the well pad being above the ground, but, but it's just a, a clear indicator of land subsidence. Uh, and we're also seeing it in, in the INSAR data that we processed. Um, so speaking of the INSAR data, this is what we processed over the valley. Um, and we have up to five centimeters per year of land subsidence in, in the area where the most pumping is happening. 
which is the area right leading up to the Little Salt Lake. The Little Salt Lake is, is this area shown in white here. So it's, it's a dry lake bed. So we used the same approach that Butler et al. used. Um, we, we took the discharge from the wells in the basin and the average annual water level change and made a, a cross plot. We removed some outliers and, and we're left with a, with a pretty good relationship between discharge and, and annual water level change. So from that, we were then able to estimate the change in storage using, again, using an in-situ approach. Okay. So now we want to compare that with what we can get from INSAR. So INSAR can do several things for us here. Um, INSAR has been used as a proxy for temporal changes in head. Um, and in fact, Anne here has done quite a bit of work in the San Luis Valley in Colorado uh, using INSAR as a proxy for changes in head. One of the things that I really love about this time series, so, so this time series is showing you deformation at one point one of the points with the highest subsidence in, in the Parowan Valley. And the, the dots here are observed subsidence from INSAR data. Um, so if you look at this, it follows really closely the analytical TICE solution for drawdown and recovery, um, except that the recovery never, never fully reaches uh, the previous year's surface elevation. But this is not head, this is deformation. Um, and, and it's just a, Again, it's just a really beautiful curve here showing drawdown and recovery. Um, so we, we used that and we developed a model that, that approximated that TICE drawdown and recovery um, to approximate the change in head, the seasonal change in head, which was actually unknown. We only had uh, springtime measurements of change in head. So we ran that through an inversion process to estimate the temporal variation in, in change in head and were able to, to fit the observed deformation really well. Um, and showed a very large swing in head, so, so 20 to even 30 meters. And at the time, we actually didn't have any transducer data or anything out there to show us uh, what that variation would look like. And since then, we put a transducer out there, and it, it's actually um, it, it's, it's matched really well what we expected. So it's, it, it's had a swing of about 30 meters in, in head. So that's one thing that we can do with, with NSAR data. Another thing we can do is estimate storage loss in confined aquifers, like I, like I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> um, so again, a loss of pore space or consolidation is the primary mechanism for storage loss in unconsolidated confined aquifers. Um, so the other mechanism for storage loss is the expansion of water. Uh, but because if, if we're dealing with these unconsolidated aquifers, they tend to be quite compressible and much more compressible than water is. And so it ends up being a, a larger component of of the storage change. Okay, so the challenge here is that most of the consolidation happens in clays, um, but most of the aquifer monitoring is biased towards sands. All right, so, so what we did next then was to take the storage change in sands that was estimated from that Butler et al. approach, the in-situ approach, and we mapped that out over the, the Parowan Valley. And then we took the storage change in clays and mapped that out over the Parowan Valley. Um, and you can see the magnitude is roughly the same. So we're, we're estimating that roughly the same amount of storage loss is happening in sands as there is in clays. Um, so how does that work? I just told you that most of the storage loss is, is happening uh, due to consolidation of, of pore space in confined aquifers. Uh, and most of that should be happening in clays, not sands. So, so what's going on? So we built a, a 3D groundwater model using ModFlow, and, and we calibrated it not just to head data, but also to subsidence. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of value in doing that. Uh, and there's actually some, some folks on, uh, here at UT Austin who have been doing similar work, um, because that calibrating to your land deformation is adding another point of, of, uh, of reference to essentially to, to relate to the water budget. Um, and, and that, that consolidation is relating to the change in water storage. At any rate, we calibrated to the subsidence and you can see that the model subsidence and the observed subsidence are, are fitting each other pretty well. Um, the model and observed drawdown uh, from, from water levels shown here on the bottom left are also uh, a fairly good match as well as the head at the final time step is shown here, model versus observed. So everything that's gridded is modeled and then the contour data and points are our observed data sets. 
so we felt pretty good about the fit of, of the model. Um, it turns out that the, the output of the model was also very similar. So we, we were estimating that roughly equal magnitudes of storage loss were happening in the sands and the clays. Okay, so again, what's going on? Why, aren't, why are we not seeing most of the storage loss happening in the clays? So we broke this out spatially, and I told you that most of the aquifer is confined, but along the edges of the aquifer, we have some alluvial fans that where there's very little clay, very few confining units, um, and so it's primarily unconfined. And, and so that's mapped here, confined versus unconfined on the left. And on the right, we have the portion of storage loss occurring in clays. So you can see in the main part of the valley where it's confined, most of the storage loss is occurring in the clays. So 75 to 86% of the storage loss. And that's what we would expect for a confined aquifer, where along the borders of the aquifer where it's not confined, you have a lot more storage loss that's occurring in the sands. Um, so, so hopefully this example showed you what the, the value of integrating these geophysical data sets. Um, again, where, where most groundwater models are, are primarily focusing on what's happening in the sands, um, but we actually have a very large storage component in the clays um, that, that's accounting for a significant amount of the storage loss in the aquifer. So, so I wanted to try an experiment here. We, you know, I mentioned that most of the time we, we don't account for subsidence and in our modeling or, or don't really account for that storage loss from clays. And I should mention that, that this could be significant even if there's not a massive subsidence signal at the surface um, because we tend to focus on these basins that have really large uh, storage loss components, but, but even in areas with smaller storage loss, you could still have a really significant portion of that coming from clays. At any rate, we made a second model then that assumed no storage loss from clays. So it just modeled it as a, a pure sand aquifer. Um, and, and because there's no storage loss from coming from the clays, that, that's actually the storage coming out of the clays is coming into the aquifer. So it's a positive flow of water into the aquifer system. So if we remove that, then we have to give some additional storage. So, so that's what we did here. We, in this model, we, we assumed, again, that there was no storage loss in the clays, and we calibrated that model to fit the observed data or, or the, our, our other model data. And we found that in order to fit the data, we had to add a significant amount of recharge, um, about 50% more recharge. And so the findings here, um, are, are indicating to me that, that by not accounting for this storage loss in the clays, particularly in confined aquifers, um, we have a potential to bias our results and, and estimate um, more recharge than, than is actually occurring. Um, so I mentioned uh, some of these EM methods, electromagnetic methods. Um, we have a towed time domain electromagnetic system. Um, and we can drive this around and, and collect geophysical data pretty rapidly. It images to a depth of about 80 meters. Um, and I have an example here of some previous work where we, we used airborne electromagnetic data, which is the physics is all the same, um, in a joint inversion framework to, to solve for both the geologic structure of the subsurface fitting the, the electromagnetic data, um, as well as the hydrologic properties that would fit the observed deformation. Um, so so uh, there, there's a lot of power in integrating those two data sets together to, to understand the aquifer framework and how that could be impacting um, some of these conceptual model assumptions. Um, so we took this system out to the Parowan Valley in November, um, and, and we had some great collaborators from the, the growers out there. Uh, they led us onto their fields, showed us how to get around the gates and everything. We, we collected about 150, whoops, about 150 kilometers of data in two days. And this is a photo out on Little Salt Lake of, of Jawe with, with our contact out there, um, Jason Bradshaw. So we got some great data. We're, we're working on processing it right now. This is, I'll just show you an initial, um, some people don't like to show preliminary data, but I'm just too excited about this not to show it. So, uh, so this is our preliminary data. This is a clay layer. This blue layer here is low resistivity. So that's a, a really um, extensive clay layer that you're seeing essentially across the entire survey, anywhere that's, that's in the valley. And as you get to the peripheries of the valley, you see these alluvial fans where the clay layers are missing. I'm sorry, my, my slides keep advancing. Um, so that's, that's kind of confirming what we had, what our other data were indicating on, on the presence of a, of a confined aquifer with, with portions that are unconfined that are probably 
where, where a lot of the recharge is happening. Okay, so from this portion of the talk, I hope I've convinced you that these water budgets are really challenging to constrain, especially in confined aquifers where we, we don't have a lot of measurements and, and we don't have a, a great way of characterizing the storage loss. Um, and so in these cases, the deformation from clays, you're getting the loss of pore space and, and that's a really valuable constraint on these flow budgets and integrating those geophysical data sets into groundwater models can really improve um, our, our model accuracy and, and reduce some of those some of the uncertainty in, in conceptual model development. Okay, so I started the talk by, by kind of sharing one of our research visions and I, I focused again, I focused this talk on, on this first bullet point here. So how can we develop these holistic groundwater models to integrate the wealth of different geophysical data sets that we have? And I feel like we're just kind of on the tip of the iceberg here in terms of, of what we can do by, by integrating these different geophysical data sets into our, into our modeling systems. Um, but I hope I've shown you that, that we can improve our, our models uh, using both process-based as well as statistical models um, by, by integrating these various data sets um, and, and, uh, and accounting again for the, for the variability and withdrawals that, that we're seeing. Um, and, and withdrawals, uh, going back to the first point that I covered, uh, I think as we, as we really improve our understanding of groundwater withdrawals, that's driving so much that's happening in these systems, and that can really open up uh, a much better understanding of, of the different feedbacks in these groundwater systems. <clears throat> so I'd like to, to just finish by, by thanking uh, collaborators, those who have worked on these projects with me, um, again, students and, and uh, colleagues from various universities. Um, and Finally, I, I'm just gonna do a little bit of free advertising. So I, I know I mentioned that I'm headed to Colorado State University in the fall and I will be looking for a, a new PhD student. So if someone's out there looking for a PhD, obviously look first at UT Austin, it's a great school, but if you're, if you're looking in Colorado, then, then uh, go ahead and send me an email. Um, and uh, that's all I have. So I'll, I'll go ahead and close there and I see there's I do want to thank you again, Ryan, very much. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, an announcement for uh, people uh, for next week, we will have a rare, uh, but hopefully in the future, not so rare live uh, speaker, we ha happen to have somebody who's going to be in town. And so we will have an in person talk on um, next Thursday. Um, we will also have a hybrid option for people who wish to continue watching hybrid, but I do appreciate everybody and Ryan, I wish you the very best in Colorado in your near future endeavors. Um, and that concludes this week's DeFord lecture. I hope to see everybody either online or in person next Thursday. Thank you very much. <laughs>